Yes, uh, thanks, Daryl, and uh, thanks for having me today. I am Chris Grotegude. I am a veterinarian in Hereford, Texas, like Daryl said. Um, when we get down to the, if we, if we take a step back for a second, and we, and we talk about systems and changes and the paths that we've all been down, it ultimately all starts with a drop of rain. And without the rain, we, ha we don't have the creation on this land, and without some trust, we don't have we don't have anything to live here for. So I'm going to do this a little bit backwards than how I normally present today. We're going to, I'm going to start first just for the overview of my perspectives of it. Uh, and some of this you already talked about in other talks. First thing, there is adequate water in the region for civilization here. No question about it. The problem is is how we use it. There is not adequate water for how civilization lives now for eternity on this area, in this area. The math doesn't work. Um, so food production is, 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 in, is on the cusp of some dynamic changes here very, very rapidly. Uh, I grew up on an irrigated farm just like Daryl did, okay? Uh, my father actually owned the company, was a partner in a company that drilled the wells and put in the pumps and all that. He came here, he, he lived the American dream. He came with 80 bucks and off the wealth of the Oglala, was able to buy some land and worked really hard. He grew up with the ethic that the harder you work, the, better, the better you do, the more you save, the, better, the more down payments you can make. And, and, and so that, that started it off on the path that I was able to continue on. I went to professional school and got my veterinary degree from Texas A&M came back to the plains and started practicing in the area and saved some money and worked hard and bought some land. That's what you do. <laughs> so if my father's folly uh, was a folly, then I guess I followed his same folly. Uh, so, but what we're learning is, is we find out that irrigation here, you know, the majority of wells under irrigated farms in the Texas Panhandle and on municipal well fields in the Texas Panhandle are declining every day that they're operating. That's going to, that's a real problem. That is the problem for, for rural life and urban life in this region. Um, so going forward on it, um, we're going back to rain-fed agriculture. We started with rain-fed agriculture prior to the 1950s drought. We're going back to rain-fed agriculture on the majority of it. As, as the water table in some of the rural areas decline, um, that, uh, Basically, you're going to find there's some really good technology out there for, for drip and for, for greenhouse production and things like that that I think will be seen in some areas going forward. But it's going to be a very limited basis because ultimately what we're going to end up with is we can choose to do it now, we choose to do it later. But as Daryl alluded to, I like to live on a water budget. And what that is is we try to pump no more water than we recharge on an annualized basis. Now, surprisingly, in our location, it's significantly better than some of the things I've read, okay? Uh, we can easily irrigate, um, depending upon the year, moisture get, uh, rainfall conditions do have some play in it because evaporation rates do affect how effective your rainfall is. But, and they also have a huge, they are, they are the driver of your recharge long term. But we, can, we found that we can reasonably well irrigate about 10% of our land fairly aggressively on an annualized basis. Now, if you're only recharging a half of an inch per acre per year, that's a, that would not be true. Because if we're putting 10 or 20 inches on 10% of our land, we would have to have two to four, some years even eight times the recharge rate to be able to make that sustainable. So what I think is going on is that there are areas in the region that we don't have the data for fully that recharge significantly well. I think there's, there's some evidence, O'Donnell, Texas, down there, down south of Lubbock here. There's some areas there that they've seen wells rise during the growing season. On our farms, we see wells rise during the growing season, even when they're being in use at times. Um, there's locations. It's very, it is not a 
fair assumption for one landowner and another landowner to think they have the exact same recharge. They don't. The management's different on the surface, and what's the hydro, the geology below their ground, and everything, that, and basically from the base of the aquifer to the surface, everything in between there matters. From the roots in the ground to the rocks that, that are in between, as to far as how, how well that area recharges. So I think going forward on this, I, I'm, I'm a proponent of grasslands. We found out that the majority of our property, the easiest, safest way to provide uh, economic stability, better recharge rates, um, l lowering our cost was, was looking at grasslands. And I think that's going to be a predominant trend of where we're going. And so it, it's going to come down to making sure everyone understands the natural sciences really, really well. And so we became a proponent. We kind of did this backwards. We chased the water table and then became a soil health regen person or operation. We didn't start going to regen soil health deal, listen to the world famous Gabe Brown and Ray Archuleta and guys like that. We started looking at the water table and then kind of fell backwards into it. So we, did, we, did, we don't do anything right. I'll just tell you that. We do a lot of things backwards. So um, but I, was, I was a kid. I grew, I, I, I grew up, I'm still a practicing Catholic. So when I was a child, and, and unfortunately, Daryl never had to hear me con, uh, go to confession, but I probably had to go to confession more than average <laughs> <laughs> because I did a lot of things backwards. So this is how we traditionally farm. This is a this is a sweet plow that's very commonly used on the on the top end of the panhandle. Uh, well, kind of plain view north. It's extremely common. It's used all the way across, but up there, it, it was the tool. This actually was was credited as uh, the predecessor would have been the Grand Hamby plow, and that was the predecessor that was the plow that saved the blowout because the one-way plows, and that plow was still used today pretty heavily in our region. I still own a couple of them. I haven't used them in a while. But so we were pretty much on a bare ground society before we went down this road. Let's see if I can get this the right direction. Okay. So I may be doing this let me go that way. Anyway. So our research concern was water. I said that. Let's see. Let's go that way. I'm backwards. I told you I do a lot of things wrong. So um, this was a normal site in the, on our farm right here. This, this is a wheat field. Look at all that brown dirt in there. You think there's a lot of covered ground in the Texas Panhandle and South Plains? No, there's, that's our number one uh, problem in our region. Is we, have, we do not have enough ground cover. And it's a huge, huge issue because it's a cultural issue that we have to deal with. We've got generations of people that believe it should be clean, that a weed is evil, that that plants are not plants. You know, a monoculture crop, that's beautiful because we can harvest it easy. It, but that blowing dust is blowing away our wealth in the region because that topsoil is what will produce the crop, okay? So we took a different route on This is a plow lake. I, I use this plow lake, not this picture. I, I've got tons of pictures of this particular lake because it intrigues me because this is a lake on one of our properties that happens to go down very fast after rain. And this is just a change up, uh, and Daryl showed one earlier. This annual ring, this, this I, I will tell you that this picture was taken, if you look at that brown ring around that lake, that brown ring forms right after the rain. When that lake comes to full level. And when it comes down, if it goes down quickly, you get a brown ring around it. Because the plants that were there were underwater just long enough that they kind of think they're going to die. And then life comes back over, over days as that, as that recovers. So you can drive up on these plow lakes and you can see how good they are or how, how good they're not if you're around them for a few weeks after rain. The good ones fill up and get, start going down immediately. And two or three weeks later or a month later, you go by there and there's not a drop of water in the lake. And most, and the really, really good ones, half the water will be gone in a matter of days. And, that, and, and I think that's, that, so this whole argument about what rate of recharge is, I don't think anyone honestly, honestly knows what the true rate of recharge is because it's so site specific. 
I think that to put it in the textbook and say this is what it is, yeah. I mean, in our math, we found out that the textbook numbers aren't per perfectly right on our properties. And so I'm, so am I thinking it's got to be too high in some and too low in others. Okay. So we, we went down this path. We are pasture croppers. We we use a no-till air seeder on our farm. We plant. We our 75% of our, our farmland is now grassland planted in native grass species. Uh, buffalo grass, blue grama, uh, green sprinkle top, um, uh, and some others in there. We've got several in the mix, and we've seen other grasses come back in now. So, so what we do in the fall of the year, if we have the moisture to plant, we no-till weed onto our farm. And if we get lucky and have good winter moisture, that weed will keep coming on, and then we can harvest it off in the spring and when we harvest it off, this is a picture uh, of it harvested off, and this is like the, a couple days after we harvested it, and you can see the, native, the grass is already poking through. So the grass is not competing directly with the wheat crop, and the wheat crop is not competing directly with the grass. And that keeps that soil covered, so we maintain those soil health principles of keeping it covered all the time and having a root in the ground at all the time, a living root in the soil. So, Along with that, the other thing we do is we, uh, we, we run cattle. Uh, this is some of our cattle around one of our lakes uh, grazing uh, last summer. Uh, we were very, very dry in the winter. We got very, very green in the summer. We went very, very dry again this winter. Um, and they're doing something I don't like them to do, but yeah, they waited in the water. And, and, but we rotation graze this cattle. We run, now, we don't have a defined size of paddock. Uh, our, our normal paddock is 160 acres, because it's easy. Uh, but there are times we'll cut them in half. There are times we'll give them more. We don't have a set time that they're on there, except that in relative terms, they're there for a short period of time, and the recovery periods are very, very long, like exceeding a year in most cases before we go back on that field. So in our property, we had essentially view it like this. We essentially have 69 paddocks. And, and we tend to rotate slower than some areas, but if we think about it, we're on a, a spot from two to seven to nine days, depending on what the, what the production there is. Uh, and we have, you know, that's worked really well for us because here we're in, a, we're in the depths of the drought. We've added cattle this year instead of taking cattle off because we still had more pasture ahead of us. The telltale truth to whether I made a mistake or not with our family business will be this summer. If we get no rain this summer, then I made a mistake. I should have added more nut units. But we were understocked going into it. And, and so that, that gave us some room to, to try to get our numbers up. So as we've gone down this road, the grass has gotten better at recovery. And we are also shepherds. Uh, yes, and those are sheep running across the county road. Sheep are amazing because you can run sheep without fences. So all these people putting fence laws in all these county, oh my gosh, sheep are horrible. You can train sheep. This is the barn, this is the barn by our house that we built. And this is the winter storm that came across. And this is just some of the sheep that came in the barn. Those sheep pen themselves every night. Because we have a, a Great Pyrenees Akbash <coughs> cross that lives there at our house that stays with those sheep. And, there's lot, and we have LED lights on in that barn, so we're wasting a little bit of energy, but we're not burning a lot of energy. And those sheep, there's a big arena on the other side of that, and those sheep put themselves in that arena every night about dark. And those lights keep the coyotes away, so that helps with predation. And so, bottom line on what we're doing, there's big, big changes coming to the people of the plains. Because the water tables in many areas are being depleted and the people don't understand why and they're having trouble with the change. Um, the time to change is now, not next year, not two years, not five years. Um, if we look at the rates of decline in some, of the part, some, count, some parts of counties, uh, if they don't change, change will come forward. Uh, the biggest problem we ran into in this situation is that when you make the change, your income declines, you have to change your business structure somewhat. So uh, relationships with, if you borrow any outside money, banking and all that's gonna be real critical. So 
people in the, in the communities need to understand that the farmer is trying to change to become more regenerative, viable, long-term, better for the community, that it's, it doesn't come for free. Um, we think that the native grasses and forbs that, are here, that were here before, before uh, colonization initially occurred, that those are the best suited plants for the region going forward. And so it's not necessarily, I, I was really proud of everybody here today and not knocking anyone if they're vegan, uh, but I was glad to see all the meat trays were gone. And because <laughs> ultimately, living on the plains, uh, it's gonna be a carnivore's place. It, it, it's, not, it's not optional. Because we have to have the ruminants to eat the grass, to keep the biocycle going, to keep the grasses healthy, to get the water cycle working. So people talking about ethics of eating, eating a hamburger or a steak or whatever, it's a bigger picture than just eating that food because it has so many ties further back in. Anyway, and that's my phone number for It's questions, problems, questions, whatever. Any uh, questions, comments? I just want to point out to you, your, 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 your sons are here and your wife? Yeah, is there, Johan is there. He's waving. And then Judith. And I don't see Joseph. Yeah, I don't know if he went to the bathroom or he ran off to the He's the tall letterhead kid who likes to read all the time. If you see him reading the book, you'll know. <laughs> But any, any questions about any of this? Any questions of the panel? Yes. Do um, you follow um, the, the general rules of permaculture in this? Absolutely. You do? Yeah. So what about soil recreation, like composting, using the organic material? OK. Over let me preface where we're at. I didn't tell you this. Our farm has been a certified organic farm since 2001. We happen to live in Deathsmith County, which is the potentially, it used to be the largest cattle feeding county in the nation. It probably is still really close to that if it's not. There's about 900,000 head of cattle, nearly a million head of cattle on feed there any given day of the year. So manure has been very easily to get. And in our organic systems, uh, compost and, and, and beef cattle manure were our predominant deal. And we probably are now at the point, as it's been pointed out by some of the people that we worked with on our farm, that we're very close to what we consider biodynamic, to where we probably have enough nutrient load um, and just have to keep it cycling at this point. Because if somebody pointed this out to me a lot long ago, um, how much nutrient do you remove when, off of a field when you buy vegetable oil? It's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nothing. It all comes from there. Vegetable oil is there. We don't think in that terms. It's the protein and the other carbohydrates that we take off. It's the protein we take off that we're pulling the nutrients out and the minerals. Go ahead. Your sheep herd. Yes. No fencing. I mean, they're bound, they're bound to fence somewhere. But I mean, Actually, we can run them without a fence. Absolutely, you yeah, can. But, okay. We're very lucky our land's blocked up very well. Okay. And it's but, a large acreage. Most people wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, most people wouldn't be able to do it because they don't have the acres we have. Mm -hmm. and one so block. if we know they've gone outside of the boundary, we keep an eye on them. And I, they see my car, I can honk twice, and they go to the barn because they know better. They know better. It's fun to watch. But I can hunt in the morning and those sheep go. You can go place them on a field in the morning and they'll graze there. And on really hot days, they're going to try to go in for, they're going to go in the middle of the day for shade, to shade up. If it's not too hot, they'll stay out, they'll stay at that far bound field most of the day. And about dark, they come running to the barn. So you manage them though fairly close to headquarters? Yeah, two, three mile radius. Okay. And That's a pretty good area if you think of three mile radius. Yes. Single <laughs> herd and I have access to all that. Yeah, and, and, and we, we have, we, 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 here's the deal, I'm the world's worst procrastinator. I've got enough fencing material to build 104 miles of fence, which would permanently fence our property. I haven't got around to it. It's all sitting in the barn. It's paid for, it's ready to go. And we, we're going to go high tensile electric. But that, so right now we still move our cattle with temporary hot wire fences. 100% temporary hot wire fences. The sheep, you can put them behind a single strand hot wire. It's easier just to place them. And, and we live in a county that actually just instilled all these fence laws, and I've talked to the commissioners before they did it. 
And, and they were like, we're not counting for you. We know, we understand, we understand, they know. Because reality is, the more barriers we put up to animal movement, the more we're over, gonna overgraze. And the more we're actually gonna have cell degradation. So this idea that fences are a solution, fences are a solution and a problem. Every solution has a problem to it also. There's no perfect anything on this earth that I've found, except Judah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> have, you, yes, have you been reading about yeah. this being able to, to collar your cattle? And then you Absolutely. I'm ecstatic I mean, by it. There's a bunch of work going on in Australia. There's five companies actually that are doing it. But most of the work's being done in Australia and New Zealand about, about uh, uh, GPS collars that you can program it. I can sit on my, I can sit on my, I can have my iPhone and go put my boundary in, and when those cattle cross that boundary, it zaps them. <laughs> Problem is my battery might go dead, but it, but you can, I think that that's probably one what was the top of technology where it's gonna be real beneficial long term. Yeah, because as someone who's, who's gone into wilderness areas and we used to run cattle and then people got all upset about it, so they've all been cold in a lot of places, and then you find out that there's no money to keep trails open, and the cows are doing a really good job about that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, we read about that, and I was thinking, man, we could start using some of our public lands efficiently and effectively, not overusing them by having this type of, you know, process where you can say, okay, guys, you get to go over here today, and you go over there tomorrow. And I, I, well, if you go up into uh, into Idaho and places like that, Pacific Northwest. Sheep are commonly heard across those areas to graze them. Yeah. And, and in California, where they kind of shunned it because they didn't want. Well, in Northern California, they Northern killed California. the grass and it's yes. not there. Yes. There's areas that's prob there's problems. But I think if you look at it, I think moving ruminants around is probably a very viable business going forward. I think I think it's kind of one of those. Uh, and I got I got world famous theologian here in the room, so I got to be careful. What is it uh, about Cain and Abel? Um, a, uh, Cain was the farmer and Abel was the was the herder and Cain you shall never find a home on this land or whatever it is and I think that's true I think we're migratory farmers that's why I think I think these migration patterns I think I think um, until we learn to live balanced with our society our, our world we're not gonna we're gonna be migrating forever I'm sorry over. Yes. Okay. So uh, it's Sorry. like um, with a lot of things, uh, it's a matter of scale, right? So you have to be uh, both certain size in terms of uh, acreage, so some of the systems may work. What do you tell folks who, uh, young folks in particular, who may be interested in trying to do these, but they don't have the acreage, they don't have the uh, the number of heads of cattle and so on? Uh, well, first of all, uh, that, that's real easy because most of these businesses all start off very small. Most of these businesses, my father's included, and, 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 then, and then mine, what, what my just and I bought, um, most of these still start off with one or two animals. They start small. And as the openings arise, I mean, uh, it's, that, it's the truth of it is, in agriculture, um, uh, land becomes available one death or bankruptcy at a time. <laughs> And th those people die every day, and people and bankruptcies happen every year. So there's always opportunity. It's just go to work, get some good mentors, and and and, and keep going forward. So on recharge, scale helps because you can see it. Now, uh, uh, like I can take this data on a quarter section. I might not be sit because my neighbor, we're getting too much pull off the neighbor. But there's enough compartmentalization of the aquifer that on our scale that we can actually see that change. That's the that's the deal. So it becomes. You, you can either own all the land in that block or you can get multi-neighbor involvement, which is really the answer I think we're going to have to go for. Thank you all so much.